Hey, my friends. Hi, it's me. You know who, David Elliott. Here we are to read another chapter of Evangeline Mudd and the Golden-Haired Apes of the Ifki Nasty Jungle, written by me and illustrated by who? Right, Andrea Wesson. Uh, you'll notice today, if you've been uh, reading along with me, that I'm sitting in a different place in my study. Uh, actually, I'm just sitting on the other side of the desk. This is how I normally sit. But I wanted to sit here for a reason, because uh, behind me you'll see a woman on a horse. She has a big banner, right? That woman is Joan of Arc. And I wrote a book, book for older kids, older uh, people, about Joan of Arc. It's called Voices, The Final Hours of Joan of Arc. I should have a copy here, but I don't. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Joan of Arc, because she was kind of amazing. You know, uh, she lived about 600 years ago. Uh, she was very poor. She could not read or write, like many people, 600 years ago. But especially for women, that would have been very unusual. But guess what? Uh, during the time when she was born, there was a war between England and France. It had been going on for a long time. So long, in fact, that it was called the 100 Years War. And guess what? When Joan of Arc was 16, she led an army of 12,000 men. And basically, she ended the 100 Years War. That's kind of incredible, right? And she had many things working against her in the Middle, of it, in the middle Ages. She was a girl at a time when men were even more powerful than they are now. And uh, she could not read or write, and she was poor. And yet, somehow, even though she had never been on a horse, most people think, she was able to lead that army and end the war. You know, Joan of Arc met with many difficulties, but no matter what happened, she just kept going, no matter what. And you'll see at the bottom of that poster, one word, onward. And that seems to me a very good motto for all of us right now, when times are a little tough. Onward, right? We don't have any other choice, so we might as well just buck up and move ahead. Well, uh, by the way, this poster is by an illustrator named Carson Ellis. And my editor uh, of the book Voices about Joan of Arc gave me that poster as a gift. It's just so nice of her. And that's in my study right now. Okay, we better read chapter 13. Uh, let's see. In the last chapter, uh, Evangeline slept in a hammock. She met Pansy, a golden-haired ape. And she also was wondering if she has what it takes to survive the icky, nasty jungle. Let's see what happens. Chapter 13. It seemed very odd to her. Hmm. When Dr. Pickethley said that the plane was waiting, Evangeline naturally assumed that she meant one of those big planes that hold hundreds of people and that serve you snacks like fizzy water and peanuts. But that wasn't what Aphrodite Pickethley meant. No. What she meant was a tiny little black thing covered with dents and scratches and chips parked at the end of a grass runway in a field where cows and sheep were grazing. Sheep were grazing. The plane, whose one wing was rust-colored and whose other wing was bright blue, reminded Evangeline so much of the little black car in which she had originally seen Dr. Pickafly that Evangeline wasn't at all sure that it wasn't, wasn't the same car with a couple of wings welded onto it. On both sides, just under the cockpit, the flying monkey was painted in bright red letters. Well, what are you waiting for, my dear? Dr. Pickafly asked. Hop in. Within a matter of seconds, Evangeline was buckled up next to Dr. Pickafly, who was already in the pilot seat, fidgeting with all kinds of levers and buttons and dials. Pansy had come along too. We may need someone to co-pilot the plane in case of emergency said Dr. Pickafly by way of explanation. I once had a chimpanzee who was quite a natural pilot. 
Evangeline had already developed a deep affection for Pansy and was delighted that she was going to accompany, accompany them to Icky Nasty. But in her heart of hearts, she really did hope that it would not come to Pansy's co-piloting the flying monkey. It isn't that I don't trust her, Evangeline said to herself. It's just that, well, she's an ape. Unfortunately, Dr. Pickafly continued, the chimp could never control his urge to loop-de-loop, -loop, so I had to ground him. Do you like to loop-de-loop, -loop, my dear? I, I don't know, the girl honestly replied. I've, I've never done it. Well, we'll have to fix that, won't we? said Dr. Pickafly. And with that, the flying monkey left the ground, loop-de-looped -looped once over the field, and headed straight in the direction of Icky Nasty. Soon, the plane was darting and bobbing thousands of feet over the surface of the sea. Evangeline was enjoying herself immensely. Dr. Aphrodite Pickafly was an excellent traveling companion, and she didn't hesitate to talk about her many adventures, searching for cotton-top tamarins on the banks of the great Ooey Gooey River, or tracking highland gorillas through the wilds of the Bugaboo Mountains. Eventually, Evangeline lost count of the hours. Pansy settled down in her lap, and soon both girl and ape were fast asleep. When Evangeline woke up, tiny brown dots of land were beginning to appear on the ocean below her. It looked as if someone had spilled a bag of chocolates on the surface of the water. Those are the itty bitties, Dr. Pickafly explained. We shall arrive in Bababoon very soon. Pansy seemed to understand what Dr. Pickafly had said. She sat up and looked ahead of her with one hand held up to her eyes to shield them from the glare. She is looking for her parents, thought Evangeline. She is looking for her parents, just like I am looking for mine. Evangeline, my dear, said Dr. Pickafly, as she pulled a knob that adjusted the flaps on the flying monkey's wings. Would you mind showing me that postcard now, the one you received from your parents before they disappeared? I'd like to have a look at it. Evangeline reached behind her and retrieved the postcard from its pocket in her pack. She handed the postcard to Dr. Pickafly. Is that your mother's drawing? Dr. Pickafly asked, examining the postcard with both hands. This meant that for the moment, nobody was actually piloting the plane. Under the stamp, I mean. Yes, said Evangeline, noting that the flying monkey seemed to be descending rapidly. She was always drawing, oh, she was always draw, drawing golden hairs. She did it all the time. Do you mind if I remove the stamp, my dear? Dr. Pickafly asked. I'd like to get a closer look. Taking extra care not to destroy the drawing underneath it, Dr. Pickafly began to pick at the stamp. By now, the flying monkey was practically in a nosedive, a fact which Dr. Pickafly paid no attention whatever to, but which Evangeline couldn't help but take notice of. In spite of her nervousness, however, she was amazed at how Dr. Pickafly's enormous hands could do such delicate work. In a matter of seconds, Dr. Pickafly had peeled the stamp back far enough so that the golden hair face beneath it was completely revealed. I knew that picking all those grubs out of the tree bark would eventually come in handy, she said. But then, as she studied the drawing, her face began to grow more serious. Evangeline, my dear, she said, handing the postcard back to the girl. Take a look at that drawing. Tell me what you see. Evangeline took the postcard and studied the drawing. She recognized the dark, bold line with which Magdalena drew, and for a moment, a heaviness filled her heart as she thought about those happy evenings in the cozy bungalow. Her mother had drawn the golden hair with its brow wrinkled and its eyes squinting and looking off to the left. The longer the girl looked at the drawing, the more it seemed to be telling her something. By now, the flying monkey was zooming straight toward the surface of the water. 
Dr. Pickersley, who had been studying Evangeline as Evangeline studied the postcard, grabbed hold of the flying monkey's controls at last, and as the little plane first leveled itself and then began to climb, the message of the drawing became clear to Evangeline just as surely as if her mother had written it with words. It was as plain as the nose on Pansy's face. That's the face golden hairs make when they're in danger, she cried. Magdalena was sending me a message. She was telling me that they were in trouble. Yes, said Dr. Pickersley. I'm afraid that she was. But I couldn't see it, Evangeline continued. <coughs> she put the stamp over it. No, my dear, said Dr. Pickersley, taking from her pocket, uh, the pocket of her dress a postcard of her own. That is where you are wrong. Your mother didn't put the stamp over the picture. Someone else did. Someone who didn't want you to see the picture at all. She handed Evangeline a second postcard. I also received a postcard from your parents, my dear, she said. It was mailed two days before yours was. Of course, I was able to read it only a few days ago. Evangeline looked at the postcard. It appeared to be the same one her parents had sent her, but the message on the back was different. We've already made a new friend here, it said in Meriwether's straight up and down hand. He's promised to guide us into the jungle to the very spot where the golden hairs were reported to have been seen. His name is Rexy, P.S. He reminds us so much of you, Aphrodite. Isn't that odd? But I don't understand, said Evangeline. This postcard sounds like everything is fine. Yes, said Dr. Pickersley. I suppose it would seem like that to anybody who didn't know Rexy. Rexy? asked Evangeline. You mean their new friend? The one who's going to guide them into the jungle? Yes, said Dr. Pickersley. Evangeline, it isn't so odd that he reminded your parents of me. An unmistakable tone of sadness had crept into her voice. It isn't, said Evangeline. It seems very odd to her. As far as she was concerned, there was no one on earth like Dr. Aphrodite Pickersley. No one. You see, Evangeline, dear, said Dr. Pickersley gravely, Rexy is my brother. Hmm. Very mysterious, don't you think? Well, let's see some art here. Oh, yeah, here's a little. Oh, I like this one. You see that? There's the flying monkey getting ready to take off. Remember how it reminded Evangeline of the car? She wondered if it was the same car. I guess that's the only piece of art. Well, let's look at chapter 14. Chapter 14, hmm, the title is Pick a Flea's Paradise. Well, we'll have to wait until next time to find out what that means. But in the meantime, Be good to the people in your life. Be good to everybody. There's no reason not to, really. And in the meantime, when things get tough, just tell yourself, think of Joan of Arc and tell yourself one word. Onward. Right? Let's say it together. Onward. That's right, guys. Okay. See you next time. Bye.